Good evening, and welcome to the Café Politique. My name is Robert Ermel, and I am the Director of Operations for the Manitoba Institute for Policy Research. To find out more about the Institute and what we do, I invite you to take a look at your handbills, your chair tonight, and visit our website at MIPR.ca. Tonight we are partnering with the Community Unemployment Help Centre to host a discussion on looking back at 75 years of unemployment insurance in Canada. Introduced after the Great Depression, this social program remains a pillar of Canada's social safety net. Since its introduction in 1940, employment insurance has gone through several evolutions and reforms. Our panel tonight will examine the intent of the program and the reason for its continued existence, the economics behind the program, and the historical, current, and future impacts of the program on our country. Our presenters this evening are Dr. David Catfield, Associate Professor of Labor Studies and Sociology at the University of Manitoba, Dr. Janice Compton, Associate Professor in the Department of Economics at the University of Manitoba, and Dr. Sid Frankel, Associate Professor in the Faculty of Social Work at the University of Manitoba as well. Our moderator tonight is Mr. Neil Cohen, Executive Director of the Community Unemployment Health Center. Following tonight's event, I invite you to fill out your feedback forms. Many of your event idea, our event ideas have come from your feedback. I'll now pass the mic to David to start off the evening. Enjoy. Thanks for coming out on such a lovely evening. Is this working well with the mic? Okay, just a bit like that. So uh, I'm going to start by asking the question, where did UI come from? Talk a little bit about the history, uh, and then talk about how the program's changed in the last 25 years, and uh, why it's changed in the way that it has, and maybe end with a few thoughts about how it should uh, change in the future. So, just to put this in a broad context, we need to remember that the problem of unemployment is something that only arises in a capitalist society uh, because uh, when people have to sell their ability to work and they become dependent on working for wages, you know, it, it, it's something which arises, doesn't arise when you have people uh, farming or fishing or being independent artisans. And so, of course, in Canada, as capitalism developed from the middle of the 1800s on, uh, unemployment became an increasingly significant social problem uh, as the percentage of people who were dependent on working for wages in an economy prone to boom and bust grew. What was the situation before 1940 when UI was created? The only recourse before 1940 in terms of programs available from the state was called relief. It's kind of ancestor of modern social assistance. Uh, it was delivered at the municipal level, so it was a patchwork quilt, different programs in different municipalities funded by property taxes. To qualify for relief, you had to go through demeaning means tests. Uh, for example, your driver's license might be confiscated, your liquor permit taken away, uh, and you might be deemed ineligible for relief if you had bank savings uh, or an insurance policy, a telephone, or a radio. So it was a highly stigmatized program. Uh, there were also work tests where male heads of households were uh, forced to do things like go out and rake leaves or pick up rocks or do other things to demonstrate that they were actually sincere about, uh, about being motivated for, for work. So that was the only recourse for the unemployed and it was something which most working class people would really avoid uh, if they possibly could because of these conditions. Often relief was paid as vouchers rather than cash, food vouchers. Uh, and the food itself was often what, what one Red Cross uh, report in 1934 called a starvation allowance. It was animated by the, long, the long-standing principle of less eligibility, which goes back to Britain in the 1800s, which was the idea that any relief provided to people needed to be set at a level below that of the lowest paid, uh, less skilled worker, uh, so that it wouldn't be an, an attractive alternative to working for wages, even in bad conditions. Uh, so this was obviously a really undesirable program, and its long-standing faults became even further exposed during the Great Depression of the 1930s. So during the Depression, mass unemployment uh, hit officially 27% in, in 1933, it was probably higher in reality, uh, and the response by governments was ineffective and ad hoc with different municipal, provincial and governments and the federal government all you know, responding in, in very limited ways. Perhaps the most notorious of these was the federal work camp system that was established where unmarried men were taken out of, really forced out of urban centers uh, into remote areas to do uh, backbreaking work in terrible conditions for, for minimal amounts of money so that they would be less uh, likely to organize and, 
and uh, agitate in the, in the cities. So the human toll of the Great Depression was, was really obvious in terms of huge numbers of people, and not just less skilled workers, but also um, more skilled workers and some middle class people losing their jobs. The impact on municipal finances was uh, disastrous because the relief system was overwhelmed by the demand uh, that was there. And so there were all sorts of fiscal problems for municipal governments and provincial governments. In addition, there was a big political factor here, and that was the unemployed workers' movement. Uh, in 1932, for example, 10,000 people marched to the provincial legislature in Winnipeg to demand action to improve relief conditions. In 1935, there was the famous On to Ottawa trek, where people mobilized, moved from the Pacific Coast through, aiming to go to Ottawa to tell the Prime Minister that really serious action needed to be taken to address unemployment. They didn't get as far as, uh, as Ottawa. They were stopped in Regina, where the famous Regina riot took place. And moving through this, this movement of unemployed workers was de the demand for unemployment insurance. There were different models that were being proposed. One was the British model of contributory insurance, which is more or less what we ended up getting in Canada. Uh, and there was also another model of non-contributory uh, UI, which would have been funded by not contributions, not premiums paid by workers, but through taxes on the wealthy and by uh, money taken from military spending. <coughs> But it wasn't until World War II, 1940, that UI was actually created uh, because of the experience of what had happened in the 1930s and the fear of post-war unrest and uh, what unemployed workers and former soldiers might do uh, at the end of the war. So initially it was a very limited program, uh, particularly slanted against married women who had you know, penalties against their access in the 1950s, uh, subsequently expanded. So that's just the background. In terms of how the program has changed in the last 25 years, to sum up, Georges Campo, who's written a very good book on the systems, identified it this way, less accessible, less open-handed, and more repressive is how he's characterized the changes. So there's been a restriction of access since 1990, if you look back over the last 25 years. In 1990, 74% of the unemployed were eligible for UI. Today, it's under 40%. Uh, again, that's also divided by gender, it's women, it's a lower percentage. Um, and we have to also remember that the official unemployment rate doesn't count everyone who really is unemployed because of all those who have given up looking for, for work, counted as discouraged workers. <coughs> so this access has been restricted through changes made, so-called reforms, by federal governments, both liberal and conservative, honorary or dishonorary honorary mention to Lloyd Axworthy, um, Winnipeg's Lloyd Axworthy, who was uh, played a prominent role in some of these measures in the mid-90s. So the restriction of access is one major change. And the other thing that's worth mentioning is the greater effort that's now made to force uh, eligible recipients, people who do qualify for, for EI, uh, off EI and into lower paid jobs further afield from where they're living. So most unemployed workers are now required after six weeks of unemployment to take jobs outside their usual occupation that pay 20 to 30% less than their previous wage uh, up to an hour away from where they work, thanks to the latest conservative changes. So what's the impact of this been? Uh, I think two things stand out. The first is to push more unemployed people to take jobs that are low paid, short term, insecure, or if they're not into those kinds of jobs, push them onto social assistance. And the other thing that's also worth mentioning, but perhaps less noticed, but I think equally important, is that these so-called reforms have uh, lowered expectations among working people, lowered expectations about what they can expect from employment, and lowered expectations of what kind of support they can expect from the state uh, in, in hard times or in the economy. The message is being reinforced that people are just individuals who have to fend for themselves when a program that all people who are working you know, for wages pay into only allows under 40% to collect. Uh, that's the message that's sent. Meanwhile, it's worth mentioning that billions of dollars have been taken out of the fund, the billions of dollars that were paid by workers and employers, premiums paid into the fund, have been just siphoned off by governments over the years to use for debt reduction, deficit reduction, and, and other schemes. Um, enormous amounts of money. So why is this happening? It's not an accident. I think that's the first point that's worth uh, bringing to mind. It's also not a series of well-intentioned mistakes. It also has absolutely nothing to do with reducing the federal deficit uh, in terms of 
the, although some of that money's been used to reduce the deficit, um, remember EI is a premium funded system, and so whatever real or imagined problems there are with the federal, uh, the federal level fiscally, that doesn't explain the, the gutting of, of what was once called UI, now called EI. I think really if we're looking to see what's driving these changes, it's that UI has been a barrier, still is a barrier to some extent, to lowering wages because it makes workers less desperate. Uh, workers, when they have access to EI, uh, find they have a temporary alternative to taking the most immediately available undesirable job. And so this has been targeted, the programs were targeted by governments which are committed to trying to dismantle barriers to corporate profits. Uh, that is a central principle of the ideology that some refer to as neoliberalism. And gutting of, gutting of the EI system helps flood particularly the low wage uh, job markets and lowers workers' expectations of what they can expect from paid employment and from the state. So I think that's what's really been behind these so-called reforms. Where does that leave us going forward in terms of how the program should change? I would argue really we need a 180 degree turn uh, in the direction of the program. I'm not saying this is likely, but uh, I think we should talk about this. Uh, at a very minimum, the number of hours of work required in order to qualify for benefits needs to be reduced. Benefits need to be increased in terms of the length of time that people are able to collect. And the rate of benefits needs to be raised from the current 55% to at least 60% of the previous pay and the punitive requirements that try to push people into undesirable jobs should be removed. Uh, but improving EI, and I'll end on this point, improving EI access is necessary, it's, it's not sufficient, because the problems that exist are really not just about unemployment, it's a series of interconnected problems. It's not just too few jobs, but too many jobs where the pay is low, there are fewer or no benefits, jobs are insecure, or dead end, and they don't contribute to human well-being, and, quite possibly they fuel climate change. Uh, so when we look at that interconnected set of problems, we realize that the issues that need to be addressed in the world of work are certainly including, but broader than the issue of unemployment. So absolutely, there needs to be reform at the level of EI, but that needs to be seen as part of a broader effort to change the nature of work. Thanks.